60 percent of the country hates Trump. But, that, but that's always been true. Um, but the idea that maybe 30 percent of the country can't stand Biden is new. That is going to pretty much sink the Democrats uh, and guarantee the Republicans going to win. If you're looking for a crystal ball for the 2024 election, you have come to the right place. There are a lot of moving pieces in this one and some big fireworks could happen. That's why we reached out to our man with big predictions and a history of being right, Jim Rickards, former advisor to the Pentagon, CIA, macroeconomist. Jim, what does everyone need to know about what's shaping up in the election for 2024 and some fireworks that could happen? Go ahead, get us caught up and let us know what we need to know. Uh, you know, a week is a lifetime in politics. That's a cliche, but it's a true cliche. Um, things change rapidly and it's very hard to make forecasts and predictions. So why would you do it so far in advance? And and the answer was that, uh, yeah, that's all true. But things are happening right now that uh, where you can see the implications of it. They will affect the election in November. Um, and we don't want our viewers and our readers to be su surprised. We want, um, you know, kind of how people structure their portfolios is up to them, but we at least want them to know uh, what's coming and what's happening and um, not be taken by surprise. So, and you can say that and you can write about it, but people have trouble internalizing it because they have a certain way of thinking about the election. You need to kind of break that up a little bit and, and think, um, uh, you know, a little, a little bit more open-ended way. Now let's talk specifically about third parties and then I'll come back to, to Trump and Biden. Um, this will be the most significant third party year since 1992. Now, there are always third parties, but they usually get 1% of the vote, 2% of the vote. You know, the libertarians always run somebody. Uh, the Green Party always runs somebody. They're on the ballot and they have a nominee every year. Although don't underestimate the impact of a one or two percenter. Um, and now I'll go back to 2016 when Donald Trump beat Hillary Clinton uh, and you know we you know, everyone knows the story on on even on the morning of the election, Hillary Clinton was getting like ninety two percent odds of winning, ninety four percent odds of winning. Nobody thought could Trump win. Trump didn't think Trump was going to win. Melania didn't think Trump was going to win. There were only a handful of people, um, you know, myself, uh, Steve Bannon, and a, and a few others who um, uh, you know kind of raised their hands and said, "Yeah, Trump is going to win." But that was a really tiny, tiny group. Um, but but why did he win? Well, he, you know, he took some key states, you know, Michigan, um, Wisconsin, uh, Pens Pennsylvania, the so-called blue wall turned into a red wall, at least for Trump. But in those states, he, remember Hillary got more popular votes. A place like California, she'll get 6 million more votes than Trump. It doesn't matter because you can only win California once. Yeah, Hillary got all the electoral votes in California. It doesn't matter if she won by six votes or 6 million votes. You only get those electoral votes one time, but she did win by like six million votes. So, so Hillary Clinton won the popular vote. So, you, but but that's not how presidential politics works. You work you go state by state, electoral vote by electoral vote, and in places like Wisconsin, Trump won, but only about like less than one percent or close to one percent. Well, Jill Stein, who is the Green Party candidate got about 2%. And to this day, you know, Hillary blames everyone for the loss, the Russians and, uh, you know, trolls and robots and uh, everything else. But um, but in, in Wisconsin, Jill Stein might have cost her that state and, um, and, and cost her the election. So even the one or 2%, in, in a world where the two leading candidates are only 1% apart, a third party that takes one or 2% can affect the outcome. So I wouldn't underestimate that. But having said that, this is going to be much, much bigger. This is going to look like 1992, where Ross Perot got 19%. Now, Ross Perot did not win one single state, but he took an enormous amount of votes from George H.W. Bush, and we got Bill Clinton uh, as a result. Uh, Bill Clinton was elected twice, never got a majority of the, of the popular vote. He won in 1992 with something like 43% of the vote. It wasn't even close to 50%. But it was more than George Bush, uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, and if if Perot had not run and he disaggregated his vote, you know, some would have voted for Clinton, but more would have voted for George H. W. Bush. George H. W. Bush would have won that election, except for Ross Perot. Um, when else has that 
been such a big factor in U.S. history. Well, the other time was 1912. Uh, what happened then? Well, you know, T- Teddy Roosevelt became president after William McKinley was assassinated. Early, M- McKinley won the presidential election in 1900. He was assassinated soon after. Teddy Roosevelt was the vice president who became the, the president. In fact, uh, uh, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt was hiking and camping in the Adirondacks. It took him two days to find him. He was up near uh, Mount Marcy, uh, if you know the uh, Adirondacks. It took a couple of days to find him. They said, hey, you're the president. So he served out the remainder of McKinley's term and then a full term on his own. Now, at the time, there was no um, no prohibition on running three or four times. In fact, FDR did win win the election four times. Um, So Roosevelt could have run again in 1908, but chose not to um, and turned it over to William Howard Taft, who was his vice president in his first and only full term, and Taft won. So now we get to 1912, and the Republicans are like, well, this is easy. We'll renominate Taft. He's a sitting incumbent president. We'll nominate him. The Democrats nominated Woodrow Wilson. But Teddy Roosevelt changed his mind, decided he wanted to run. He contested the Republican nomination with Taft. Taft won, but then Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt goes out and starts a third party called the Bull Moose Party, and he got also about 19% of the vote, about the same as Ross Perot. Didn't win, did not win a single state, but it cost Taft the election, and we got Woodrow Wilson. And what did Woodrow Wilson give us? Um, The the Federal Reserve... (laughs) the income tax, um, direct election of senators, all these progressive ideas, um, really bad ideas in many ways, came, uh, World War I, uh, came uh, under Woodrow Wilson, but Wilson would not have won if Teddy Roosevelt hadn't been a third party. So 1912, 1992 are your two models. 1968, a little bit with George uh, George Wallace, although not as big a factor as the others. That's the kind of year this is going to be. So right now, uh, RFK Jr., Robert F. Kennedy Jr., tried really hard to be a Democrat. I mean, who's who's more Democratic than the Kennedy family, right? Going back to you know the nineteen Joseph P. Kennedy in the nineteen forties, um, no one. Uh, but the the Democratic Party today is not the Democratic Party of JFK and um, and, and RFK Jr.'s father, you know, Bobby Kennedy. Uh, it's completely changed. It's it's radical. It's extreme. It's so-called progressive, but really neo-Marxist. Um, and they really don't have any interest in RFK Jr. They want Biden, at least for now, because he's a puppet. Um, so, so okay, why not just have a primary season and let the best person win? Well, the answer is no. The Democrats don't actually believe in democracy. They like to rig the game. They kicked, uh, they, they tried to get New Hampshire to move its primary after South Carolina. You know, New Hampshire is always the first primary in the country. Um, but New Hampshire is completely run by Republicans. We have a governor, Sununu, and both houses of the legislature are controlled by Republicans. And stay, I, I live in New Hampshire, but I'm coming to you live from New Hampshire right now. Um, and um, uh, by statute, New Hampshire has to be first. It's not even a choice or a committee decision. It's actually the law of the state of New Hampshire. And just two days ago, New Hampshire announced the date of the New Hampshire primary. And guess what? It's a week before South Carolina. The DNC, Democratic National Committee, wanted South Carolina to go first because uh, what happened in in, uh, 2020. Uh, Joe Biden finished fifth in New Hampshire, fifth, not second or third, fifth behind uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, Amy Klobuchar, um, and I think Buttigieg and a couple couple of the other candidates at the time. but he won South Carolina. So they want South Carolina to be first. It's not happening. Now, Biden said, well, okay, I'm not running in New Hampshire. All right. Um, Kennedy was going to run, but then they said, the DNC said, anybody who runs in New Hampshire, if you get any delegates, um, we're not going to seat those delegates at the convention. So it won't do you any good. Uh, and then they went further. They said, it's not just running. If you set foot in New Hampshire, if you even go to New Hampshire, um, and you know, the thing about New Hampshire politics is the ultimate retail politics. I mean, I, I met many of the candidates in uh, 2020, and I've already, I, I was at a, I had a talk with Vivek Ramaswamy. He was at a local uh, town hall here. It was, it was a small group, and he was very open. So talked to him for a little bit, and the other candidates will be coming through in the weeks ahead. It's only two months away. Um, so 
So Kennedy was basically forced out of the party by the Democrats themselves, and he's going third party. He's polling around 15%, and that's without much effort. He's getting a ton of money, a lot of contributions. He's got the money. He's got the brains. He's got the lawyers. He's in the process of getting on the ballot. That's hard. I worked for, uh, 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 I was involved in, uh, was it 2012 with a third party effort and a presidential candidate and had some top notch polling. So I actually have a little experience uh, in how that all works behind the curtain. Not easy to get on the ballot, but Kennedy can do it. Now you've got Cornell West, is running uh, on the Green Party ticket uh, for the nomination. Cornell West is a uh, kind of a hard shell Marxist. I don't agree with much, of, if anything, of what he says, but he is brilliant. A great TV presence, a great, great rhetorically, uh, great, on, as I say, great on TV, great public speaker. Um, so whether you agree with him or not, yeah, that is what it is. But I'm trying to evaluate him as a candidate. Uh, he's very powerful. He's smart, uh, articulate, telegenic. He'll get out there and he'll get votes. And Jill Stein is back. She's running on the Green Party, too. I'm not sure how Cornell West and Jill Stein are going to sort that out. But the other, you know, kind of, you know, 200 pound gorilla in the room is Joe Manchin. Uh, Joe Manchin is United States Senator from West Virginia, a Democrat. Uh, he was probably going to lose. He's up for election this year. So just the other day, he announced he's not running for Senate. So you can kind of flip that seat over to the Republicans. It, it's uh, even Republicans aren't dumb enough to lose West Virginia. So um, so he'll probably get. So that'll be a Republican seat, which is a big deal in terms of the Senate. But Manchin said he didn't announce he was running for president, but he said I'm going on what they call a, a listening tour, meaning you go around the country, you go to whatever Chamber of Commerce, uh, Rotary Club, uh, you, you know, a high school auditorium, uh, you know, a, a a, a dinner, et cetera. Um, and the, and you, you kind of get your name out there and get all the local press coverage uh, and you get to hear what people think. Well, that is a prelude to announcing that he's going to run for president. So he hasn't formally announced yet, but uh, I expect he will. And he'll probably go on something called the No Labels Party. Uh, I guess No Label is a label, but uh, they, they've done it. They did with this other party I was talking about in 2012 I worked with. Did They got on the ballot. So um, so you're very likely to come into Election Day, November 5th, 2024. Uh, I'll talk about Biden and Trump in a second. But with uh, RFK Jr., Cornell West, Jill Stein, and Joe Manchin, all of whom are very powerful in their own way. They're all different from each other, but they have their following. The polls show that 70 percent or more of the Democrats don't want Joe Biden to run. And 33 percent of the Democrats said they would vote for RFK Jr. if he did run as an independent. So you're likely to see some number and it's hard to say what, but kind of 20 percent or more of the vote going to these third party candidates, mostly Democrats because they don't like Biden. I mean, you know, 60 percent of the country hates Trump. But, that, but that's always been true. Um, but the idea that maybe 30 percent of the country can't stand Biden is new. And for an incumbent president of a major party. So that is going to pretty much sink the Democrats uh, and guarantee the Republicans going to win. Now, let's have a but again, people aren't ready for this. It's happening. You can kind of pick it up in threads from the, the media and so forth. But nobody's thinking about it. And they're, you know, you got to be a certain age to remember 1992. I don't remember 1912, but uh, I read about it. Um and uh, so this doesn't happen often. As I mentioned, there are two cases in the last uh, uh, 110 years, but um, but it does happen. And this could be, this looks like one of those times. Now, if you're a Democrat, and I'm talking about Democratic power brokers, because Democrats don't really believe in democracy. I mean, they go through the motions and they accuse Trump of being, uh, you know, a dictator or whatever. But it's the Democrats who rigged the elections. They ran Bernie Sanders off the road in 2016. They ran Bernie Sanders off the road again in 2020. He probably would have got the nomination both times if they had, you know, kind of played fair, but they don't. Um, so what do you do if you're a Democrat? Well, you don't want Biden, uh, you know, age, they talk about age, but age is sort of a euphemism for, you know, cognitive decline. I mean, it's not all about age, but um, age is part of it, but it is about cognitive decline, physical decline, you know, Biden can't 
I mean, well, I don't need to recite all the times where he finishes a speech and he doesn't know where to go. He's, he's just like wandering around the stage. Someone's got to come up and, you know, kind of take him by the hand and, and lead him to the next uh, destination so he doesn't like fall off the stage. So how do you do that? Well, what I expect is the following, that Biden will actually run in the primaries, not New Hampshire, but we've been through that, but, you know, South Carolina, Georgia, Super Tuesday, he'll run in the primaries, kind of like the basement strategy that we saw in 2020. Remember the uh, the rallies and the movie theaters would be 20 cars flashing lights and honking their horns because of COVID. I don't even know what that was, but that was his idea of a rally. Trump would have 25,000 people in the stadium. But um, so some variation of the basement strategy um, and rack up a lot of delegates. But then come, now watch, mark mark this down, next May or June, probably May, uh, Biden will announce that he's not running. Now, um, that's not the same as resigning. I'm not saying he's going to resign from the presidency. I'm going to say that he's going to announce that he's not running for the nomination. No, he's not running for re-election. Um, but he said, well, he's got all those delegates. Yeah, but he can release the delegates. That's what, that's the part people don't understand. Biden can release the delegates. Now, in the Democrats, Democratic Party, you have this other category called, other category called superdelegates. Superdelegates are not elected. Uh, they are, they're party officials, county chairs, state chairs, insiders, Donna Brazil, Jim, James Carville, whatever. There's this class of superdelegates. It's about a third of the total delegates. So the superdelegates will, you know, when Biden says I'm not running, they'll announce for fill in the blank. Gavin Newsom is obviously the most likely person, but it could be uh, Jay Pritzker of Illinois, Gretchen Whitmer, Michigan, even this nut, uh, Jennifer Grantham is our secretary of uh, energy. Um, she's a big part of the Green News scam. Um, but one of them uh, will be the nominee. And then the party will turn to the regular delegates and say, you got to get in line. And they will because they're Democrats. And all of a sudden, you'll have a convention in July or August of 2024 that nominates, let's say, Gavin Newsom, even though Biden got all the delegates because he stepped aside and released them. So he's he's a stalking horse. Biden is a stalking horse for probably Gavin Newsom. Um, and so then so what you really have to ask yourself is, can Gavin Newsom beat Donald Trump? Because Donald Trump is almost certainly the Republican nominee. Again, like him or hate him, I don't want to get into that, but I can read polls and I can do math, and Trump is heading for the nomination. So now you can't think about Biden versus Trump and don't even look at polls about Biden versus Trump because it's going to be Gavin Newsom versus Trump. But so how does that work out? Well, in a two-way race where people don't even know who Gavin Newsom is, I mean, they've seen him on TV or whatever, but but he's the, he's a new face. Um, he'll read scripted remarks and all that. Newsom might run ahead of Trump in a two-way race because Trump has a ceiling. Trump's got 40% locked in, like so solid. I've never seen a more solid base, but you can't win with 40%. You need, you don't necessarily need 50, but you need, you need uh, 48, 49 overall, and you need 50, 51 in seven or eight swing states. And Trump can't quite get there on his own because the anti-Trump factor is so strong. But if you strip 20% away from the Democrats for the because of the third parties, which we already talked about, then Trump wins. Uh, so, you know, put your crash helmet on, get ready, because this is going to be a, a very wild ride. And then just another wild card in the deck. Um, Trump is on a criminal trial. He's been indicted criminally for about 100 felonies in four different jurisdictions. Uh, those trial dates are set, uh, well, one of them has already begun. The January, uh, the the Georgia vote rigging trial has already begun, but we're in pretrial motions. It's, they haven't picked a jury or actually started that. They might, but the other cases, um, one's in uh, Palm Beach County um, on the uh, classified documents. One's in Washington, D.C. on the January 6th riots. One's in New York on um, the, uh, the um, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, the, the the hush money case. I forget that. Uh, uh, model, I'll say model. <laughs> forget her name, but um, uh, th that that case. And you know, then the business records. It's, it's a lousy case. They all are, but mm -hmm. uh, that's another criminal trial. So he's going to get convicted somewhere. I mean, yes, yeah, some some of these will be delayed. Some of the charges will be dismissed. Some of them, you know, they'll be dropped. 
but there's so many in so many different places that he's going to get convicted of something. So he'll kind of be a convicted felon on election day. Will he be behind bars? Possibly. And I, it, it doesn't matter. Well, it, it does matter actually, but, but it doesn't stop you from being president. A convicted felon who is in, in prison can be elected president of the United States. There is no constitutional legal prohibition on that. So will Trump be like orange hair, orange prison jumpsuit behind bars on election day? Maybe. But even if he isn't, if he's out pending appeal, he'll still be a convicted felon, but he might get elected. Uh, but the big, big, the, so, the, so the three big variables is Trump convicted felon, probably yes. Is Biden the, can, the opposing candidate? Probably not. Probably Gavin Newsom. Uh, and what's the impact of the third party? And the answer is this year, huge. It usually, usually isn't, but this year it is. And it could tip the vote to Trump. Okay. Let's put on our hypothetical hat here. And Jim, I'm going to ask you a question off script. I'm, I'm seeing some comments come in. Let's just say two different things happen. And one is against your prediction. So like, again, this is completely hypothetical. Sure. But what is, say Newsom wins, say somehow the third party doesn't play like Newsom wins. What's the worst case scenario there? Like, say we wake up after the election, they're like, hey, Newsom, Newsom's the president. Sure. That is going to be an ugly reality for people. What's what's something, what's the worst case scenario? What, what do you think happens quickly where, you know, we, we start heading down the wrong road? Well, we've been talking politics. We talked international economics with China, but we haven't talked about the U.S. economy. Uh, the U.S. economy is heading for a recession, may already be in one. And you know, we never know. Um, you never know you're in a recession until it already started. And you look back and say, oh, gee, you know, uh, um, interest rates are peak, stock market's coming down, unemployment's going up, initial claims are going up, et cetera. You can look at all that data, and there's a lot more besides, and say it doesn't look good. But then it's like, oh, gee, it's actually a lot worse than we thought. We've been in the recession since, let's say, October 2023. Um, but whether we're in one right now, which we may be, or we're in one soon, which is highly likely, you're going to roll into 2024 and all this electoral politics that we just discussed in a recession, possibly a bad one, and maybe a, a, the, a, what we call what I call stage two of the banking panic. Don't forget good old Silicon Valley Bank and First Republic and Credit, Credit Suisse failed. 1877, I believe, uh, one of the biggest, oldest banks in the world failed. You got the shotgun wedding with UBS. So everyone's like, oh, well, thank goodness the banking crisis is over. It's not over. Uh, it's in. Um, it's at halftime. Everyone's in the locker room, but they're going to come out and play a second half. There's going to be stage two of the, that banking crisis. A financial crisis is not the same as a recession. But what if we had both? So, all, I mean, do you really want to be Gavin Newsom or anyone for that matter? Well, see, Trump's out of office, so he can run as the guy who's going to fix the problem. Gavin Newsom is a Democrat. Okay, he's not president of the United States, but he is governor of California. He is a Democrat. He's going to get tagged with this. He's going to be like Biden light. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a pretty scary thought. But uh, uh, he's going to be kind of in the Biden camp, if you will. Um, he'll be able to claim that he'll do things differently. But look at California. I mean, President Xi of China came to California for a summer. What did they do? They had to like go out and physically remove all these homeless people and, and hobos and bums and drug addicts, clean up the needles, tear down the tents. They then like got public sanitation into like power wash the sidewalks. I don't, I don't want to tell you what was on the sidewalks using chem chemical solvents, et cetera, and cleaned it up. Only a certain area, by the way, kind of around where the um, where the summit was. Then they put up a wall. All these people hate walls. Well, they put up a wall, a security perimeter around where the summit was. So these homeless people couldn't get in there. Um, well, that's how bad it was that they had to do that. Now that she's gone, they're going to take the wall down. And it'll be back the way it was. It, it's an open sewer. Um, yeah. so is that, and LA is not much better. Um, they mandated, uh, electric vehicles, which don't work. I mean, they, they, they physically go down the road, but they don't, uh, they don't solve any environmental problems. There, there really aren't any with CO2. Um, they're, they're, uh, pushing these things nationwide, destroying their economy. So it's just the guy you want as president. So I would say if he mm -hmm. wins, that's not my forecast, but, it, but if he does, get ready for the uh, uh, the whole country to look like California, which is a pretty scary thought. And then real quick, so if Trump wins, which is your prediction, what do you think, what's something good that happens quickly there? Because we'll we'll have a, a changing of the tide, I would assume. Yeah, I think 
uh, Trump had a lot of failures. Uh, you know, he's, he talks a good game, but he's from Queens, so he's kind of a blowhard. I mean, he Trump said, we're going to build a wall. Well, the, the wall is estimated about 1,800 miles from kind of Brownsville, Texas to San Diego, you know, pick your, pick your spots, but about 1,800 miles. Trump built 50 miles, 5-0, of new wall and refurbished about 200 miles of existing wall where he, he made it better. Um, so where I come from, if your goal is 1,800 miles and you did 250 miles, you failed. Uh, now he'll blame Nancy Pelosi and all that, but you know, you think if Nancy Pelosi were president, she would have let anybody stand in her way? I mean, Trump doesn't have the cojones to actually do so. He talks a good game. I agree. If you gave me 10 Trump policies, I would probably agree with nine of them, maybe all 10. My problem with Trump is that he he doesn't actually do anything. Um, and, you know, people say, you know, Christopher Ray, head of the FBI, the FBI goon squad, smashing down doors. It looks like a neo-fascist. I agree with that. Who appointed Christopher Ray? It was Donald Trump. Uh, this, you know, the U.S. attorney in Delaware is giving Hunter Biden a sweetheart deal. Yeah, that's true. Who appointed that U.S. attorney? Donald Trump. In other words, Trump doesn't know anything about the appointments process. He doesn't really understand how his own government works. Um he, I'll give him points on foreign policy. He, we did not have any new wars under Trump. I think it's a major accomplishment. Um, he did open doors to North Korea. Um, you look at North Korea today, they're in bed with the Russians, supplying them weapons, but that was not true under Trump. Um, there was no major war in the Middle East under Trump, et, et, et cetera. Uh, so I'll give Trump very good marks on foreign policy. He says stuff he means that people take him seriously. Uh, and of course, the president has a much freer hand in foreign policy under the constitution historically it's in domestic policy things like the budget and the wall uh and and a lot else um where uh you know trump says we're going to stop social media from censoring he didn't uh the, you know the censorship of social media right through the election and certainly amplified in the biden administration is worse than ever they've trashed the first amendment um so the question is has trump learned anything uh and what I see, um, he does, he is relying on a couple of think tanks to help him with the appointments process. He, he's awful at it. No one's worse, uh, in my experience. Um, there's something called the Plum Book. Uh, you can buy it from the government printing office. I'm sure it's available online. The Plum Book is a list of, uh, it's at least 3,000, but maybe much higher, maybe 5,000 or more government jobs, important government jobs, where the president can just pick anyone he wants. It's not the civil service. Um, basically, the president has appointment power. Sometimes Senate confirmation is required, but but not all of them. Uh, and what you're supposed to do, and what Obama did in 2008 with help from Valerie Jarrett and a lot of other people behind the curtain, they filled in every one of those blanks, thousands of jobs. They said, this person's getting this. And it's not just cabinet level. It's deputy secretary, assistant secretary, deputy assistant secretary, uh, heads of agencies, SEC, EPA, you know, FTC, et cetera. They had them all figured out with loyalists. Um, and then Trump was clueless, didn't understand what I just described, didn't have that list. He, Trump made Chris Christie the head of his transition. Jared Kushner put Chris, uh, sorry, Chris Christie put Jared Kushner's father in jail. Do you think there's any love loss between Christie and the and the Trump family? Uh, so why would you pick Christie as your transition advisor when Jared Kushner hates his guts and probably vice versa? Another dumb move by Trump. And nobody thought Trump was going to win. Chris Christie didn't think Trump was going to win. So he never did any transition work because he said there's not going to be a transition because Hillary is going to win, which shows that he's an idiot. So, um, so this time... Uh, so what that means is that all those Obama, those 8,000 Obama appointees I described, they're still in place. A lot of them are still there today, even after four years of Trump, and certainly Biden didn't do anything to change it. They were there the whole time. They are the deep state and, and you know, the Russia hoax and, uh, um, you know, the Mueller report and um, the, the, the inspector general, uh, all this stuff we heard about for four years. Nothing happened. Nothing happened because the deep state made sure it didn't. So, so Trump's to blame for all that. Now, the question is, will he do better this time? I, uh, my information is he has a couple of think tanks that are working on this. They're filling in all the blanks. Trump can't do it, but they are. And if Trump goes with that, they're going to put in real loyalists, not just competent bureaucrats, but, you know, kind of hard shell conservative Republican Trump 
loyalists who then will try to clean out the swamp. Trump did not do it the first time, but he might do it the second time. So if he keeps up his A game in foreign policy and he improves his appointments process in domestic policy, see, I would, you know, I'm not running for anything, but I would I would fire the director of the FBI, but I would fire the deputy director, the assistant deputy. I would clean out the first four or five tiers. You're all fired, just day one. You're all fired. And, you know, get some temps in there. Or uh, maybe bring the agency to a halt temporarily, and then get some good people in who are who are going to, you know, uphold justice and apply justice equally and stop weaponizing the DOJ. Um, let's see. So I guess uh, I think Trump would be good on foreign policy. He's pretty good on economic policy. Some talk that he'll bring back Steve Munchen as Secretary of the Treasury. I think Mun- Munchen did a good job. Wall Street has a lot of confidence in him. So it could be a lot better than the Trump first term. We're talking big fireworks in 2024 here. We're not far away from this election and the things that are going to unfold. You just got a crystal ball into what Jim thinks, very specific dates, and what we see coming in some best and worst case scenarios. So hope you appreciate it. If you can, do us a favor. Here at Paradigm Press, we're working hard to bring you the stories that matter. We're bringing you uncensored stuff from Jim and the rest of our stable of world-class thinkers. Go ahead, give us a like. Comment below if you want to hear something else from us or you've got an opinion on what Jim just said. And also, please, please subscribe to our channel and we'll see you next time.